Last week we got to uh, we got to talk about the promise. We got to talk about the promise that God made in Genesis that we uh, are really celebrating at this time of year, the celebration of the, the celebration of the coming of Christ. Uh, today I want to talk to you about who this this uh, this child is. Who is it that we're we're celebrating here? Uh, who is it that we uh, are oohing and odd over when we look over into the manger? And uh, before before we get into that, I, I want to say that I'm glad to have my wife and my my children here with me finally for the first. first time. Yeah, we're uh, and if I haven't gotten to shake your hand or talk to you or anything, hang out with the Laughter Church. I'd love to get to do that. There's so many people that I, I had to get to talk to. You. If you see my wife walking around out there, please stop and get to know her. She's you can't miss her. She's about six foot two. Uh, she has <laughs> yeah, she has blonde hair, and, but she only speaks German, so speaks real slow when you talk to her. <laughs> but yeah, boo. Now when I say that, it really got to her this morning when I said it in their other service. But that's not that's not who my wife is. She's not six foot two. She's not blonde, and she definitely doesn't speak German. So to be honest, if that's the middle picture I have of my wife, uh, I don't know who who it is I'm talking about. Uh, I could call her Dana Malata. That's her name all day long. But that's not Dana Malata. Uh, and if I got up here before you and I said, if I was to say, I'm happy to have my wife here today, and I really love Dana Bellata, uh you all clapped, and that was a wonderful thing for a husband to say. But if you knew that in my mind I was thinking of some six foot tall blonde woman, that would not be a good thing. That would not be a good thing. And I don't care how often and how loudly I said, oh, I love Dana Bellata, if you knew that I was not talking about the real Dana Bellata, uh, it wouldn't make much difference. But there's a lot of, lot of times people call Jesus what they think in their mind this Jesus ought to be. Some people say, you know, Jesus is, he, he's more than a good teacher. He's more than just a great guy that God blessed. Uh, if you're not worshiping the real Jesus, then you're not worshiping God. If you're not trusting in the real Jesus, only the real Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture can save you. I, I thought about bringing, I don't know, like a Coke can up here or something. A Dr. Pepper can is sitting on there and just going into this big long thing and calling the Coke can Jesus and, and all that kind of thing. I thought that might be a little too blasphemous, but uh, I could call anything in the world Jesus I wanted to. But if it's not the real Jesus, if it's not the true Jesus of Scripture, if it's not the God of all creation, it's not going to save you when you stand before God. It's not going to help you at all. The true Jesus is going to be standing there. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is going to be standing there at the judgment bar of God. And he will either say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So it's important that we understand who the real Jesus is. Not the Jesus that the world proclaims. Not necessarily the baby in the manger that you see in the nativity scenes. I don't have anything against nativity scenes. We've got one in our house. But if all you think of when you think of Jesus is the cute little baby that we ooh and ah over. You may not be worshiping the real Jesus. So in John chapter 1. What I want to do is I want to take you just through a few things here that we see in John. Uh, I'm going to read probably just down to verse 14. The actual prologue goes to 18, but I think I'll stop in verse 14. In verse 1, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning, the Word, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Many of the songs we sang this morning talk about the light coming into the darkness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. 
and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Today, what I want to do is, as we talk about, we get closer and closer to Christmas. Next week is Christmas Eve. Next Sunday is Christmas Eve. We need to understand who the real Jesus is. We need to understand that it's not just, not just what we think about Jesus, but what the Word of God says about Jesus, who He is. Just like you didn't like the fact that my mental image of Dana could have been some other thing. We need to know, I need to make sure you understand, I, I love the real Dana. And when we say I love Jesus, we need to make sure we're talking about the real Jesus. First thing I need you to see in this text is that this Jesus that we worship, He has eternally been God. He didn't come into existence just in Bethlehem. He wasn't born in Bethlehem and that's when He first uh, came to be. He has always been God. He has always been in existence. Before there was creation, before there was anything, He has existed as the second person of the Trinity. He has always been God. You can see it proclaimed throughout the Old Testament. You can see pictures and shadows and foreshadows of Jesus and what He would do. You can see the second person of the Trinity in the Old Testament. You can see types and shadows of that. But He has always been God. It says there in the very first text, it says, in the beginning. John is taking this from Genesis. You know the very first uh, verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John takes this and he brings it over into the New Testament context and he says, in the beginning, was the Word. I don't care how far you push back the beginning. You can talk about the beginning of creation. You can talk about the beginning of time. You can talk about the beginning of whatever it is you want to talk about. But when we talk about in the beginning, we talk, we, we make, he makes sure we understand that the Word already was. He was already in existence before there was a creation. It says that also in verse 3 there where it says He created all things. All things were made through Him. Through the Word, through Christ, Jesus is our Creator. He is the Creator of all things, heaven and earth. It says, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That means everything. Spirits, powers, uh, authorities, all things invisible, all things visible. Jesus is the Creator. He has eternally existed as God. You must believe that to trust in the true Jesus. Over and over in the Gospel of John, he uses my, my favorite little phrase that he uses over and over again. The I am sayings. You've heard the I am sayings in John. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am uh, the, I am the door. I am. He uses those, those phrases and that I am is the same name of God that God told Moses in the burning bush when Moses said, how, how they're going to listen to me? Who am I going to tell them sent me? And God said, you tell them I am that I am sent me sent you. Jesus uses those same terms for himself. My favorite is when the soldiers came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Are you him? And he said, I am. And they immediately fell back because of the power of his name. A lot of your translations, the modern English translations will say, I am he. But there's no he that's supplied by the translators. He simply said, I am. And the power of his name caused them to fall back. He is the I am. And Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 24, he said to the Jews that were, that were talking to him there, he said, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sin. It's necessary for us to trust the true Jesus to understand that he is the I am. He is God in and of himself. And he has always been God. When you and I look over into the manger and we can ooh and ah over the baby, we can, we can goo and go over, over this sweet little meek and mild child that has come. This child is God himself. He is the eternal God. Over and again in Colossians chapter 1, it says He is the creator. All things were made for Him and by Him and in Him all things hold together. He is our creator. He is God. It will not do to just say, well, I love Jesus and I have a Jesus sign in my yard, but the Jesus that I serve is, you know, He's just a great teacher that God just indwelt. It will not do. That Jesus doesn't exist. He won't save you. Because he won't be there. The Jesus that will save you is God eternal. 
But it also says here in verse 1 and 2, he is God, but it also says he is with God. The, verse 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, that's kind of strange to us, that he is God, but yet he's with God. And what we say, I don't have time to give you a full exposition of the doctrine of the Trinity. We're going to do that on a very uh, a Wednesday night coming up real soon. So if you've not come in on Wednesday night to Bible study, you're going to want to be here for those things. But let me just give you a quick rundown of what the Bible says about this. There is only one God. In the one being of God, there exists three co-eternal persons. Co-eternal and co-equal persons. That's a big, long definition. Let me explain it to you just a little simpler. There is one being in this pulpit. This pulpit has being. If I throw it across the room, you will feel it, I promise. It's heaven. It has being. It's real. There are no persons in this pulpit. The pulpit doesn't care if you talk bad about it. Doesn't care. It's not going to hear you if you pray to it. It's not going to. There are no persons in it. There is, I have being. I have a little too much being, to be honest with you. And in the one being that is me, there is only one person. If you have more than one person in your being, seek professional help. <laughs> but in the one being of God, the one God, there are three co-eternal, co-equal persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is something that you and I must believe. And the reason we must believe it, first of all, is because the Bible teaches it. But second of all, it is, it is the most beautiful thing I think I have ever come across in Scripture as it pertains to our salvation. Think about this. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, God is fill in the blank. What is it? God is great. Well, what does it say? God is love, right? Before creation, we're going to work on our fill in the blanks. <laughs> before creation, before creation ever was, before there were trees, before there were people, before there was air, before there was space, before there were stars. God existed eternally as love. How are you love if there is no object to receive your love? God existed as love because God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. For all eternity, before there was creation, God the Father loved the Son. They existed in relationship with one another. God the Father loved the Son. The Son loved the Father. The Father loved the Spirit. They existed in a love relationship with one another. And God created man. To be in that relationship with him. He created man not because he was bored. Not because he didn't have anything to do. But because he desired for mankind to be in that love relationship with him. And we talked about it last week. What happened? The curse. The fall. Sin separates mankind from God. He can no longer come into the fellowship of God. And the Son of God. The second person of the Trinity. Leaves the splendor of heaven. Becomes a man. Verse 14 says the word became flesh. He becomes a man. And he lives the perfect life that we were supposed to live. That we can't live. He comes and gives that perfect life as a sacrifice for sin. And he rises from the dead. Defeating death. Paying the penalty that you and I owe. And when he ascends to the heavens. And sits down at the right hand of the father. He brings all of us who trust in him. Back into that relationship that existed in eternity past. We can now be in perfect love relationship with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Why? Because the Bible says, the New Testament says, we are in Christ. It says, if any man is be in Christ, he is a new creature. We have received all spiritual blessings in Christ. I often wonder, this is just me thinking, so bear with me just for a moment. In my Imagination. I often thought, what would it be like for the Son of God, after He ascends to heaven, to stroll back into the heavenly courtroom of His Father? I mean, you get the picture of trumpets blaring and angels singing, and, and He has completed the work that was given to Him. He has died for the sins of the world. He has conquered death, defeated the curse, and He comes back into the heavenly courtroom of His Father. Can you imagine what the Father felt as His Son comes triumphantly strolling back into it, nothing but love and pride and he completed the work that I gave him to do. He, he has done what no one else could do. 
when you and I stand before the Father, He will see us in that same way. Not because we did it. Not because we were so good. Not because we accomplished anything. But because we are in Christ. That Jesus existed eternally with God. Although being God is one of the most beautiful truths of Scripture. And 1 John tells us, if you don't have the Son, if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. So it's not negotiable. It's not negotiable whether you believe that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 1 John says you can't deny that there's a Son and think that you have the Father. So when we look at this, we already see in just the first three verses that Jesus is God. And Jesus is also with God. We're going to talk more about that on Wednesday night. Not this Wednesday night, but after the first of the year. But you and I need to make sure we understand when we look into this manger that we're going to be celebrating in the next in the coming weeks. This is not just a baby meek and mild. This is not just a, a little child who was chosen by God. This is God. The word became flesh. Verse 14. He is all God. 100 percent God. 100 percent man. And it has to be that way because only God can deliver you from your sin. Only God can pay for the sin that you and I owe. Only God himself can perfectly keep the law. But in order to pay for my sin. He has to be a man. Has to be fully man. And so he came. The word became flesh. The next thing I want you to see in this text is that only Christ, he alone has life. He alone gives life. This is kind of a no brainer for us, I'm sure. It says in him, in him, verse four was life and the life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. He has life in himself. This baby we look, he looks as helpless as any other baby. He's a real baby. He grew into a real man. And he grew the same way you and I grow. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He cried when he didn't get enough sleep or when he was hungry. All those things were true when he was a baby. All those things were true. But when you look into the manger, you're not seeing a helpless little baby there alone. You are seeing the life of Giver, It is through him that you come into right relationship with God. He has life in himself. In, in 1 John, it also says that those who have the son, whoever has the son has the life. Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There is no one who will come to the father except through Jesus Christ. Except through the real Jesus. No one comes to the Father except Him. You can't work out your own plan. You can't do your own thing. You, you know, I've heard many people say, God and I have our own thing going. Yeah, I'm sorry. God has had His thing going since uh, creation began. You either jump into his, his plan, His program, or you get left out. He alone has life. He alone gives life. You cannot come through any other means. Anyone who comes through any other door is a thief and a robber. You cannot come to the Father and be accepted. You cannot go to heaven. You cannot be accepted in His presence unless you come through the Son of God, through His death and His resurrection. And this is, is something, the picture is just so vivid. He, he shares this life with us as if it is light shining in the darkness. Did you see it? It says, in Him was life in verse 4, and the light was the light of men. This light, it shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, some of your translations may say comprehend it there instead of overcoming it. But the word is to seize, to grab hold. The darkness could not take hold of it. It couldn't overcome it. I get the picture of, I don't know, think about maybe a 200,000 square foot warehouse. And inside is pitch black. You can't see anything. Like your eyes can't even adjust to it. It's just black. You can't see Two feet in front of your face. There's nothing. It's like walking around in a black hole. And then all of a sudden, the tiniest little light way on the other end of the warehouse shines. You can see it as far as you can see because in, in, in darkness, light always conquers. This light, I, I, I don't, I, 
Light cannot stay. A darkness cannot stay around light. When that light erupts, even the tiniest light, it will chase away all the darkness. Jesus came into the world that was plagued with death and darkness because of the fall. It was plagued with sin and suffering. We talked about that last week. And in that darkness, he brought light. The Bible says those who are dwelling in darkness have seen a great light as he came. He has brought that light. To us, He has brought eternal life, which is a light shining in the darkness to us. And it is only through him that you can have that life. There is, it's only through him that you can have life eternally with the father. And it's only through him. He said, I come to give you life and that more abundantly. It is only through him that you can live. It says in, in John chapter five, I believe it is. He says that those who come to him have passed from death to life. It's a reality. You and I, if we are in Christ, we have that life. And this is not a secret. He has given the testimony of it. In the next, in the next verse, it says, uh, verse uh, 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. He came to bear witness about the light. It's clear. It's been given. The testimony has been given. This is not secret knowledge. Hey, guys, y'all all come to me, and I'll give you the secret knowledge that nobody else knows. And we'll get in there. All... No. It's been proclaimed. It's so simple that a child can come and receive this light. It's so simple and so known that a little, a little child who doesn't understand that much about the Trinity can come and be saved in Christ. It's been proclaimed for us in the Old Testament as it points forward to Christ. The prophets foretold Christ. And then we have the New Testament chronicling the birth of Christ and the apostles teaching about Christ and how we are to live in Christ. It has been given. It has been given to us. And it's on. It's almost as if it's on a silver platter saying, here it is. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to strive for it. Romans chapter 10 says the word is close to your heart and it's in your mouth. The word that if you, uh, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. I've touched something. Didn't I? It's clear. I'm sorry. You kind of messed up coming this morning because you won't be able to say I didn't know. You won't be able to say I didn't have a clue. You won't be able to say I didn't understand. The testimony has been given that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God, and that he is with God and that he has come, became flesh so that you and I can come back into the presence of God and enjoy the fellowship with God. It's clear. The testimony has been clear. He sent John as the forerunner to announce this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He, you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to understand it all. You don't have to come and, and put your mental faculties. You have to trust Him. The final thing that we'll look at and where I want to spend the most of my time here is this last part. He's given clear, He is God. He is with God. He is the only life, the only one who gives life, and he's given clear testimony of, his, of himself. But the little baby in the manger that we celebrate, this baby, he demands that you respond. He demands a response from you. Look what it says in, uh, in, in verse uh, 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. There are only two options in this text. You either receive him or you do not receive him. There's no middle ground. There's no third way. There's no option C. It's one or the other. It says there were those who did not receive him, who did not know him, and there were those who received him. Make sure you understand this language. Notice what we're talking about. We're talking about receiving him. Look in your, look in your, in your text there in verse, um, uh, verse 12, verse 11 and 12. He came to his own people, but they did not receive him. But to all who did receive him. 
We're not talking about just accepting a plan. We're not talking about just signing a contract and saying, I'll do my part if you do your part. We're talking about receiving a person. We're talking about not just the plan of salvation. We're talking about the man of salvation. We're talking about coming into relationship with him. We're not just talking about knowledge. You need knowledge. You need to know that Jesus died for you. You need to know that he rose from the grave. You need, but that alone in itself is not salvation. I could march Satan himself through that back door and stand him right up here on this pulpit and say, Mr. Satan, or whatever he likes to be called, Dr. Satan, whatever. I can say, do you believe that there was once a man who came, born in a manger, named Jesus Christ? He would say, absolutely, I believe it. I would say, do you believe that he died on a cross 2,000 years ago to pay for sin? Satan would say, absolutely. I know that it's true. I was there. Uh, I could say, Satan, do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? He would say, of course he did because I've been fighting against him ever since. I could say, Satan, do you believe that he is the only way to be saved? And he would say, of course I believe that he is. That's a fact. That's really my battle. That's what I'm fighting against. So really, I could march him right up here and he would ascend to all the truths that many people think make them a Christian. The one thing that he would never do is he would never bow the knee to this Jesus. He would never receive this Christ as his Lord and Savior. He would never, not that he could anyway, but not, he would never come and say, I, I bow my knee to him and I give my life to him. He would never do that. We're talking about receiving a person. We're talking about coming into relationship. You and I, I knew the facts of the gospel all my life. I knew the truth. I believed the truth of scripture all of my life. But I wasn't saved until I came by grace through faith and trusted in this Jesus for myself. He's always been mom and daddy's Jesus. Well, of course, I'm, I, I met one lady one time and says, of course, I'm a Christian. I'm from Texas. <laughs> He's got to be real to you. The real Jesus has to be real to you. And to be honest, you may not believe today that Jesus is God, but you will. You will. One, one way or another, you will. You may not believe that he is Lord of all creation, but you will. The difference is, every knee is going to bow. The difference is, will you bow the knee here? Or will you be forced to bow in eternity? How do I receive him? That's the question, isn't it? How do I receive him? Luckily, you don't have to take my word for it. It tells us right here in the text. He says, but to all who did receive him, this is how you do it. Who believed in his name. It's not hard. It's not complex. A little child can do it. You don't have to have all the doctrinal truths of every who believed in his name. Today, the word belief has got, you know, I can believe, I believe I'm going to eat when I leave here. I believe that it rained last night. I believe that the sun's going to shine tomorrow. I believe that, you know, I believe when my wife left Tennessee that she was going to make it to Kansas on, on time and alive and nothing. I can believe all kinds of things, but the kind of faith that John talks about throughout his gospel, and I can demonstrate it to you, is a trust. It's a trust of yourself to trust in his name, to receive him. Salvation is not just up here. It's here. And it's here. I say that because you walk it. You walk it out. You receive him, the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in your heart, and you come to know him. You are changed. And it's not about doing better. It's about being changed by the power of God, by grace through faith. Today, you are going to make a decision. You are going to respond. If you've been intently listening, and you've been, you know, God has been speaking to you and you've been, you know, you've been just on the edge of your seat. You're going to make a response to this. If you hadn't paid attention to anything and really I've just done a terrible job and I couldn't hold your attention. And you know what? I'm ready to go eat. And he needs to hurry up. You're going to respond too. you will make a response today. Even if you don't do 
anything. But today, what you and I, what we all, everyone in this sanctuary, from this side all the way over to this side, what we must do today, whether you are saved or have never been saved, we must repent of our sin and we must trust in this real Jesus. Today, if you repent of your sin and you trust in Christ for the first time, he says he will save you for eternity. He will save you forever. You'll become a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. And you will be accepted in the eyes of the Father. Not because of how good you become and how wonderful you do from here on out, but because of what Jesus has done for you. And today, if you've been saved for 50 or 60 years, you need to come with me today again and say, I'm going to repent of my sin and I'm going to trust in Jesus. And then when you wake up tomorrow, you need to repent of your sin and you need to trust in Jesus. You're not getting saved again. There's no such thing as that. But you are daily getting up to repent of your sin. Growing in your repentance. Growing in your faith. He said that he would deliver you. And he demands that you respond to him today. As the praise team is going to come. If there is anything that you need to respond in. You need to come. You need to come. And you, you can... If you're here and you're a visitor, if you're here and you've never been saved, you, you can get saved right where you're at. You can call out to Christ. You don't need me to intercede for you. All you need is Jesus. You trust in Him. You do business with Him. You call out and believe on His name. That's what the text says. It says those who received Him who believe in His name. You trust in Him. Repent of your sin and trust in Christ. And He says you will be saved. And every day from that point until the day that you go and you be with Christ, you wake up every single morning and you repent of your sin and you trust in Jesus. You will grow in your repentance. You will grow in your trust in Christ. What we must do today is trust in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Not ooh and ah over a baby. Although that baby is our King. That baby that came in the manger, the fulfillment of that promise, He didn't stay in the manger. He grew to be a man. And that man, God and man, lived a perfect life that you cannot live, but you must live. If you're going to go to heaven, you must be perfect. Or someone who is perfect must fill in your spot, must take the punishment for you. And only one offered that. His name was Jesus. And he offers it freely for you today. Trust in his name. Give him your life. And then walk with him for the rest of your life and all eternity. You stand, let's pray together.